We're joined by Joshua Benton. You're with uh, the Neiman Journalism Lab at Harvard. You've been looking at uh, the future of uh, the newsroom and uh, the future for newspapers. Do they have a future? Because we're, at the moment we're seeing that they've gone from free to now putting up paywalls, but um, there seems to be a lot of uncertainty in the industry. There is a huge amount of uncertainty. Uh, in the United States since 2006, about one third of all newspaper journalists have lost their jobs. And newspaper publishers are so, were so used in the United States to making lots of money without trying all that hard. We had an unusual situation of monopolies in most American cities. And now that they're facing this new competition from the internet and uh, because consumers have an, a wide array of choices available to them, they're finding it uh, tough sledding. We're seeing newspapers closing down in the US and then uh, essentially opening up online editions. Well, there have been a few newspapers, particularly in two newspaper cities in the United States, that have switched to going online. The Seattle Post Intelligencer is one example. Uh, but in the process of going online, they laid off about nine-tenths of their staff. So it's not a business model that supports a newsroom of the size that a newspaper used to have. But it's an attempt to try and maintain a remnant of an extra editorial voice in the city. It seems clear, though, that people aren't going to pay for what is essentially a commodity. Right. I think that one thing that newspapers uh, are focusing on is their print editions. Uh, they, while they may not have a monopoly on the, on the internet, uh, they still have solid print products, which is where the majority of their income comes from. Uh, most, most newspaper companies in the United States earn 90% of their revenue, or 85 to 90% from the print edition. So I think that's one area that they will, they will focus on. Um, you see newspapers trying to create niche publications that may only target one small area of what they used to traditionally cover. We try to do that in such an in-depth and, and unique way that customers might consider that uh, worthwhile, worth paying for. And you're also seeing news organizations trying to shift their advertising model. Um, there are a lot of local companies and businesses that aren't sure how to adapt to the internet, and newspapers would like to be the, the conduit, the link that, that allows these local businesses to have an advertising strategy. So you're seeing newspapers take a more direct role in, in the sales portion on the business side of the operation. Will we effectively see the major players surviving, such as the New York Times, The Guardian, um, but then at the sort of micro level we'll get community newspapers? Part of that, that prediction matches up with how we live our lives today. We live our lives as Americans or as Britons or as, or as you know, Germans. We live it at a national level. We also live it at a very local level. Um, we don't as much live it on the regional level or on the, on the you know, large metropolitan area level. Um, so I think in some ways that's reflective of the change in how we live our lives. But I, I, think, I think you're right that the national newspapers, I don't worry that much about the New York Times, I don't worry that much about the Wall Street Journal, they're going to be fine. They actually ha reach a broader audience because of the reach of the internet that people who would have loved their content before but didn't have access to it. And the local papers are, are going to struggle through but they're going to be alright. It is that middle tier, the, the Boston Globes, the Dallas Morning News, the Baltimore Suns that are going to be in a lot of trouble. Rupert Murdoch is uh, looking to uh, put up paid walls, but um, from what you're seeing, that's, that really isn't going to work. Well, I think that there are some newspapers for which a paid content model can work. Uh, usually the financial press can pull it off. There might be organ news organizations that do focus on one niche, that, that, that niche is powerful enough that they can afford to charge people. But when you're a news organization, like most newspapers are, that offers general news, the kind of news that can be easily substituted by any number of free sources online, it becomes very difficult to charge. Um, for every American newspaper that is interested in charging for their website, there's a long line of local competitors who are happy to take all the free traffic away. And that's the real reason why newspapers, for the most part, haven't gone the paid content route, because they've been so afraid that this brand that they have built up for a hundred years or more could go away in an instant if a local television station or a local online startup suddenly becomes the free alternative. If only two or three percent of your readers are willing to pay, what are those other 97 percent going to do? They're probably going to go to another website that doesn't have the cost structure that a you know, large newspaper has. And in the conference you gave the example of one newspaper that did try to uh, put up the paywalls but then only had something like three dozen online subscribers. That's right, Newsday uh, newspaper on Long Island uh, decided to put up a paywall. They did have a few ex uh, exit strategies, they'd have a few ways to get access to the newspaper without the subscription, but they found after a few months that only 35 people had subscribed to the online edition of the newspaper. Uh, I think that most news or newspapers that are thinking about putting up a paywall are really primarily interested in protecting their print readership. They, that's where they make their money. They want to give 
print readers a reason to subscribe to the newspaper. And if they can say, well, if you buy a print subscription, you'll also get access to the website, something that not everyone else gets, that can be an extra incentive. And that's something that newspapers are really going to be trying more of, I think. So newspapers then could perhaps use live events to make money. Or are there other ways, other things that they should be looking at? Right. I think newspapers for them have, have a few key competencies that, that can help them out. They have relationships with more advertisers in their local market than anyone else. You know, they, that's, that's, that's a set of relationships that I would suggest they try exploiting through many different me uh, methods. They also have a, a convening power of, of the powerful or notable within a community that not many organizations have. That's one area where events can come in. If you start holding conferences and consortia and, and other events that can engage the public and can be something that people will be willing to charge for. Um, I think all of these are, these are all options, these are all ways you can generate some money, but I, I don't see them adding up to the enormous pile of money that the old model generated when people just had local advertising monopolies and could have 20% profit margins without trying very hard. Are you a pessimist? I'm a, a pessimist for existing newspaper companies. I'm a total optimist that there's going to be more information available to consumers and to readers than has ever been the case before. This is already true. I don't think that's going to change. We are seeing a, a, a remarkable e uh, ecosystem of new online startups arrive, both at the local and at the national levels in the United States and elsewhere. And they're innovating, they're coming up with new models. And while I may not be optimistic for the old players and their sustainability and their willingness to change and to innovate into this new world, I think that as consumers and as citizens of democracies, we're going to be okay.